The atmosphere in the Situation Room was tense. If Chancellor Vitram so chose, she could have probably cut it with a swipe of her talons. Are you certain? She asked, a lump in her throat. Absolutely, I am certain, said the reptilian Emperor Eldori. The statistics have barely any margin for error, and the Empire's best people have checked the results over too many times to count. The room turned grim. Commissary General Tykdiv's mandibles chittered in worry. Then we are lost, said the Krulvik. He was an insectoid creature, and his kind had suffered dearly for the crime of appearing repulsive to humans. We should prepare our contingencies. How long do we have? asked Vitram, her red and orange feathers the color of a fire that she did not feel one bit. Days? Months? Years? Eldori's color-changing face flashed black as he spoke with the tone of a doctor pronouncing a terminal diagnosis. Chancellor, you know our two nations will take the brunt of the offensive. We have, at most, a decade before our two species are effectively extinct. And what about the galactic coalition as a whole? Squawked Vitram. How long before the humans wipe out us all? We won't be wiped out at all with the proper planning retorted President Kelvek of the Strauki Confederacy. You are all welcome to join us on our ark ships. Her hologram wavered as she spoke. The Situation Room was on the coalition capital world of Vamaz, which was coincidentally also the homeworld of the Krell species. Travel between systems took so long that it was simpler for most to just use hypercom communicators to be at the conference in spirit if not in person. And then what? Snapped Eldori. Live in fear? hide in nebulae, scavenge water and minerals from asteroids until the UHA finally finds us to finish the job. The United Human Alliance was intensely xenophobic, and they had been fighting and winning a war of extermination against the Galactic Coalition for over 60 years. The Coalition used to have almost 50 species in its fold, all helping to make a shining bastion of peace and democracy. Decades of fighting a losing battle and being pushed back inch by inch, system by system, had reduced that number to merely 30 with a population above 100,000. Most species had at least a few surviving members, but their numbers were so thin and spread out that they were inconsequential in the grand scheme of things. No, said Emperor Eldori, the blood of his warlike ancestors flowing in his veins once more. The Krell Empire will fight to the last, no matter what the cost may be. You can flee if you wish, President Kelvek. Anyone who wants to join her, make your arrangements but my empire will never flee from tyranny. Eldori sat up straighter and placed his six-fingered hands on the table as he finished his speech on a high note. The Krell Empire has always been the great sword of justice, and we shall remain that way until our end. Decades ago, when the United Human Alliance first launched its campaign of xenophobic genocide, the coalition was caught unprepared. They had destroyed their weapons willingly, having known nothing but peace and collaboration for a century before they met humanity. Three species were nearly rendered extinct before the first armed resistance began, and nearly a dozen were added to that toll before the Krell returned to their militant roots and took up arms once more. Granted, such arms were very feeble. The United Human Alliance had perfected warfare down to a science, and the Krell had not engaged in armed conflict since they founded the Galactic Coalition all those years ago. Every species left had a massive military, diverting double-digit percentages of their treasury to defense forces, but none could match the humans in ferocity or combat skill. They could barely hold on to their existing worlds without the UHA atomizing them from orbit or invading with marines and troopships. We've all heard the stories, said a woman whose name was not important. We know what the humans will do once they win. The UHA showed no mercy to their opponents. They used such horribly cruel weapons and tactics that even the Nazis of Earth would have flinched if they saw such things in action. No one in the UHA had ever heard of a Nazi before, and the Nazis had no idea what the letters UH and A were supposed to mean together, but they would have thought highly of each other. To top it all off, the Alliance recorded their cruelest atrocities. They sent the recordings to the Coalition via hypercoms whenever possible using this knowledge to inspire fear and wage psychological warfare against their enemies. Most, if not all, military and governmental leaders had watched these recordings or seen the events they recorded firsthand. Worlds reduced to ash, children gassed or tortured, white phosphorus falling on cities, 
The men and women assembled in the coalition situation room had seen it all. There is a way, said Vitram with a wavering voice, to win the war, a contingency the Republic has held as a closely guarded secret. The Irad Republic was a representative democracy armed with a powerful military force, and they let the world know it. They were rarely secretive. What is it? Boom Del Dori. Your average Krell was an imposing figure, standing six feet tall with light gray scales that covered powerful muscles from their high-gravity homeworld, and their emperor was no exception. And why have you withheld it? I have withheld it because I did not want to cause a panic, said Vitram answering the second question but avoiding the first. I know what you will all think, and I think it too, but there is no other choice. If this plan fails, the chance of our doom will rise no higher. She paused, folding her wings behind her involuntarily, while her taloned claws fidgeted in her lap. Republic probes have made a discovery a month ago, one that I hoped never to have to reveal. She paused, trying to phrase her statement as well as she could. I have discovered a new planet of humans. Instantly, the situation room went into an uproar. What? shrieked one man. What do you mean? Exterminate them! shouted another. Twenty-eight of the thirty people in the situation room yelled and shouted, waving manipulator appendages wildly in the air, and it took them several seconds to realize they had been muted. Are you quite finished? asked Emperor Eldori. The leaders of thirty species sat quietly in their chairs. Good. Now, Chancellor, explain to us your plan. Thank you. Vitram chirped. That wasn't figurative either. Irads like her were an avian species. They spoke in musical chirps and bird songs that were quite pleasing to most sapient's ears or whatever their equivalent to an ear happened to be. I'll admit, this is a desperate plan, but I believe I can make it work. The United Human Alliance has been beating us so soundly and consistently because they have a mastery of warfare that far surpasses ours. She explained, Humans are biologically superior to us, and it's as simple as that. We cannot become better fighters, at least not feasibly or on a scale that would be necessary to start winning, so I propose we recruit these isolated humans and make them into our protectors. Commissary General Tychtiv shouted, You've lost your mind! even though no one could hear him. I've seen the recordings, said Vitram. The Irad Republic, my republic, has experienced the horrors that humanity can bring to bear firsthand. I do not speak naively when I say this, that these new humans are not like the UHA. She put a heavy emphasis on that last part. They have been troubled in their past and are still troubled today, but they abhor genocide. Evil has tried to conquer them just like it did the nations of the Alliance and I can say for certain that it did not win this time. I'm ready to forward evidence of these humans' good nature to anyone who requests it. I want to be clear. Emperor Eldori's stentorian voice filled the room. He was a colossal man, and when he spoke that size was only amplified. Are you suggesting we form an alliance with these humans? That is exactly what I'm suggesting. If this plan fails, we'll all die, but we're all going to die anyway. Vitram explained. If this plan succeeds, we can use our humans as a bulwark to at least buy time against the UHA. If all goes well, victory will be on the horizon. I intend to personally visit these primitive humans and oversee their uplift. Eldori mused a sound plan and turned on everyone's microphones. If any of you have complaints or questions, you may voice them now. Once again, the room was in uproar before being abruptly silenced. Never mind said the Emperor. Chancellor, I sincerely apologize for this uncivilized behavior. The mere mention of humans gets most of the coalition into a terrified frenzy. I understand, Vitram replied. I can't blame them for reacting like this. I'm afraid of going to a world crawling with humans myself. Besides, it's not your fault. If anyone wishes to speak to Vitram, you must now go through standard Republic channels, rumbled Emperor Eldori. This session is now over. With that, the holograms winked out. The situation room turned silent. In her personal estate on Yera Prime, homeworld of the Irads and capital of the Irad Republic, Chancellor Vitram summoned her most trusted aide. Terrace, a snow-white Irad woman entered Vitram's personal situation room. She was clad in the light gray uniform of a member of Vitram's personal staff 
and she moved with an elegance that belied her hot-headed nature. What is it, Elixa? She chirped. The two knew each other well enough to be on a first-name basis. Contact Admiral Jeddak. I want an RDF. Space Battle Squadron ready and waiting within the hour. Right away, Terrace replied. What for? To win the war. Well, that settles it. I'll be on my way. With that, Terrace executed a perfect about-face and walked out of the room. She had served in the military, after all, so this did not surprise Vitram in the slightest. She retracted the talons on her slender claws since they wouldn't mesh well with a touchscreen, and with a few swift taps on her personal datapad, she had a standard uplift package ready for deployment. Half an hour later, the Chancellor's personal shuttle lifted off from her landing pad and two RDF. Planetary attack skimmers flanked it as it rose through the atmosphere. We'll be boarding the Republic's claw shortly, Chancellor. Came through the intercom in the passenger section. Admiral Jeddak is waiting for you in the main hangar bay. A few hundred thousand kilometers away, the flagship of the Republic Defense Force hung silently in geostationary orbit. A two-kilometer-long flag dreadnought armed with extensive laser arrays, powerful particle cannons and torpedo batteries, and a mammoth spinal weapon. The Republic's claw was a formidable and comforting sight for the IRAD civilians under its shadow. The attack skimmers had long since dropped back to the surface, being incapable of spaceflight, and in the span of a few minutes, Chancellor Vitram boarded the pride of RDF, Space Battle Fleet Yera. Yera was the name of the IRAD's home star, and it was always capitalized just like the name of every other star. The names of stars, planets, and species were always capitalized, with the exception of humans because of the horrible acts that one species has committed. In ancient Yeran legends, it was said that Yera was the original home of the Ayarads. They committed some sin that was lost to history, and as a punishment, the gods cast them from the heavens and stripped them of their ability to fly. Modern scientists did not subscribe to this theory, but it was an interesting tale to tell. Yera was the Ayarads' original home in ancient legends, so it was called Yera, but the world where they evolved was known as Yera Prime since that was where they lived now. Irads couldn't fly, but that was based purely on evolutionary facts rather than some original sin their ancestors committed. There was a certain leap that had to be made between the birds that roamed the skies and the Irads that owned the treetops, and somewhere during that leap, their wings lost the strength and size to generate lift. They were now only useful for displaying one's emotions and slowing their fall as they dove from the treetops to land on unsuspecting prey. The talons at the end of all four of their dexterous limbs were too sharp just to be used to cling to branches, after all. We are now boarding the Republic's claw. The pilot announced. Vitram looked up from her datapad to see the green and gold of the dreadnought's small hangar replacing the black of space. The RDF's color scheme was green with gold inlays the green taken from the Ayurad's arboreal roots, and the gold added sparingly for artistic detail. It did do an excellent job at reflecting lasers, but the Coalition hadn't yet figured out that they should use it for that purpose. Attention! Chancellor on deck! Admiral Jeddak barked as soon as Vitram stepped out of her shuttle. He stepped forward to help her down, as was customary when dealing with someone of such high status, but she refused. Thank you, Admiral! but I can handle myself. Admiral Jeddak was the supreme commander of the Republic Defense Force, and his jet-black RDF uniform would have been covered in medals if he bothered to wear them for anything but ceremonies. His feathers were shades of brown, and he stood just a few inches shorter than most humans. While female Ayurads sported vibrant and colorful feathers to attract mates, the males were colored in shades of gray, brown, or black to be camouflaged while hunting. Why do we need all this firepower? Jeddak asked as he followed Vitram to the bridge. A fifth of the Yera Prime garrison fleet shouldn't be taken away lightly. It's about the human colony, explained Vitram. I'm going to contact them and hopefully recruit them in our fight against the UHA, but should that fail you and your fleet will be needed to cauterize their homeworld. A show of force, then. Jeddak reasoned, speaking the Chancellor's thoughts so accurately that he might have been telepathic. To make sure the primitives will fall in line. Exactly, Vitram replied. I've studied their history, and I found a man named Perry quite inspiring in his deals with those more primitive than him. Their military tactics could be useful to learn from as well. I've seen the reports, Chancellor. 
Jeddak grumbled, falling into the same old argument. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Coalition species aren't capable of matching a human's mastery of battle tactics. It's impressive that we don't break and run when the humans start to win. The worst problem the armed forces of the Galactic Coalition had was their lack of proper strategy. Their military tactics were sound, but the admirals and generals of the Alliance could play them like fiddles when a battle was raging. Perhaps the reason our militaries are so hapless is because we don't have humans around to aid us. Vitrum reasoned. Whatever the case may be, adding the galaxy's most fearsome fighters to our list of allies is still a worthy cause. What about our other allies? Asked Jeddak. How is the rest of the coalition reacting to the news about our plan? The Krell Empire is firmly on our side. Vitrum reassured her nation's finest officer. The other species may have their problems with us, but they won't dare oppose the Empire. And besides, once Republic humans give their lives to defend the coalition that will silence any dissent. A squad of ten RDF. Space Marines trotted by them, the sergeant in charge leading his men in a marching song from a long gone nation on Yara Prime. Irad's legs were evolved to be able to grasp branches, having a combination of a ball and socket joint and a standard leg joint because of this, and their feet could be used as manipulators when needed. This, combined with the added maneuverability their wings gave them, made RDF Marines deadly in zero-gravity combat. Vitrum and Jeddak turned a corner, and four Marines in black armor flanked a blast door made of a sturdy and lightweight alloy. Chancellor, they all saluted as the door slid open. At ease, Admiral Jeddak said before he passed through the blast door and it sealed behind him. He and Vitrum were now in the fleet bridge of the flagship of RDF space, and that fact was certainly visible. Dozens of IRAD crewmen sat at consoles, tapping away to do their assigned tasks, and in the center of the oval room there stood a circular holodable from which Admiral Jeddak could command a vast fleet. There were no windows on either the fleet bridge or the regular bridge since both of them were buried deep within the reinforced core of the Republic's claw, but view screens connected to exterior sensors gave the officers assembled in both a chance to see outside of the ship. Sir, a fleet liaison saluted Admiral Jeddak. The battle squadron is ready for deployment. Have the fleet charge their wormhole drives and move to the edge of the solar system, said Jeddak. Set a course for the soul system. We're going to Earth. It was a hot day in Washington, D.C., the result of climate change spiraling out of control and the world's consistent refusal to truly confront it. In the Oval Office, President Marcus Wayne sipped a glass of champagne and looked over policies he could present to Congress about that particular issue. They had a decent chance to fail, of course, but that had never stopped him before. It was the year 2046 in Earth time, and while a fleet of ships from another star traveled through a wormhole towards him, Marcus Wayne read the dossiers his cabinet had so graciously provided him over and over again. He wanted them to be flawless, like everything else in his life. His meeting with Congress was in one hour, so he had time to kill. A lesser or more lazy man would have used this time to relax. But Marcus was not lazy. He triple-checked his facts and statistics, read his lines and pre-made talking points aloud to see how they sounded, and he was just about to put all of that preparation to use when a Secret Service member burst into the room. President Wayne, he exclaimed, you're gonna wanna see this. What is it? Marcus asked. Is there a security threat? No, Mr. President, said the black-suited bodyguard. Come with me. Marcus did come with him, and before long they were deep in the classified underbelly of the White House. A squad of heavily armed guards flanked a steel vault door, and when Marcus' biometric scan granted him clearance, he passed through it and entered a top-secret situation room. His cabinet, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, a couple of four-star generals, and several other officials were already there. What's the situation? He asked. Before anyone could answer him, Marcus' gaze swept the room and landed on an official from SETI. Said official spoke up, confirming what he already suspected. We've discovered extraterrestrial life, Mr. President. Marcus was shocked. His analytical mind, which was always quick to come up with a snappy comeback or political idea, was blank for a few precious seconds. There's a flotilla of around a hundred spaceships heading for Earth. Our best estimates put their ETA at two hours. Marcus took a few seconds to process this news, 
and then he took a few seconds more to process his response to it. Have they tried to contact us? Negative. We've attempted all forms of communication we can, but there's been no response. The man from SETI saw Marcus becoming visibly discouraged, and he added it's possible that their technology is simply too advanced or alien to communicate with us. As an afterthought, that's absurd. Scoffed Marcus. They're an advanced species. They'd find a way if they wanted to talk to us. On the fleet bridge of the Republic's Claw, Admiral Jeddak was trying and failing to find a way. What do you mean, communications don't work? Jeddak hissed. I have the readouts right here. Get me a channel to whatever government Earth has, or I'll wear your feathers as a coat. That threat may have been empty, but when it was spoken by ancient Irad warriors and kings it usually was not. Empty threats made for bad idioms. The comms work fine. A fleet liaison corrected him. But their receivers are, well, behind the times. Primitives. Jeddak scoffed. Have engineering rig up something that's down on their level. That one particular liaison liaised with engineering, and after Jeddak's orders were relayed, they began work on a kludge-together radio transmitter. Back on the fleet bridge, Admiral Jeddak tapped his talons idly on the holodable. This act would have caused severe damage to the thing if it had been done a few hundred years ago, but Irads tapped their talons on things so often that their designers had just given up and reinforced them by this point. Admiral. An officer spoke up hesitantly, the number, arrangement, and color of the triangles on her chest denoting her as a high-level fleet liaison. Permission to speak? Speak freely. I'm nervous, sir. About the humans. Said the liaison. Good. Jeddak replied, startling the liaison because she had expected a reprimand. If you weren't, I would suspect something was amiss. What if they're not peaceful like the Chancellor said? What if... She paused. What if they're just like the UHA? Evil is bred, not born. Jeddak reassured her. The UHA is vile and its humans are sadly beyond our help. But I believe Chancellor Vitram when she says these humans are to be trusted. Back on Earth, the world was panicking. The Russian Federation had mobilized its Black Sea Fleet. India and China had their nuclear arsenals ready to launch at a moment's notice. America was recalling its overseas troops to protect the homeland. Deep in everyone's hearts, however, was the somber realization that nothing they did would matter. If these aliens were hostile, they would glass the planet and leave. If they were friendly, the people of Earth would enter a new golden age. What outcome they would bring depended entirely on chance, and houses of prayer were packed to capacity for every second leading up to the Republic fleet's first transmission. Hundreds of world leaders in Beijing, Moscow, Washington, D.C., and many other cities watched as the first being from another planet spoke to them. She was sitting at a command desk, her vibrant red and orange feathers freshly preened and mostly covered with an elegant robe. Attention, leaders of Earth. She began. I speak for a nation known as the Irad Republic. My name is Chancellor Elixa Vitram, though the proper way to address me is simply Chancellor or Chancellor Vitram. The details of first contact will be smoothed out on board my flagship, and shuttles will be sent to collect a team of no more than three negotiators. What is important now is this, we come in peace. Well, that's good. Quipped President Wayne. He was in his mid-thirties, incredibly young for a president of the United States, but the voters had wanted a new face for some time now and he had proven many times over that his age did not limit him. Anyway, back to work. He pointed at his subordinates, issuing orders in a much more serious tone. I want DEFCON brought up to two, and I want a channel open to the Republic flagship. I will be on one of those shuttles, and I don't care who I kick off to do it. In the city of New York, one of the negotiators looked up at the night sky. Thousands of stars were visible that night, thousands of pinpricks of light against a canvas of darkness. A hundred of them were moving, while the vanguard of an interstellar nation flew toward Earth at speeds faster than any human craft could reach, UN Secretary General Mart Avik watched as history was made. Hundreds of miles above him, the Republic's claw decelerated to a full stop and deployed three shuttles with a fighter escort for them all. Above every capital city in the world, or at least the most important ones, a starship of the Irad Republic decelerated and began to orbit. Chancellor Vitram had spent quite some time studying the best way to make contact, 
and she had finally settled on a show of force to both impress and cow the people of Earth. A hundred warships, bristling with advanced weaponry, could certainly put on an impressive show. A few minutes later, forty-one balls of fire hurtled toward the city of New York. The people panicked, and the NYPD tried and failed to contain the fleeing masses as they clogged every exit. Just a few dozen meters above the tallest skyscrapers, the balls of fire stopped their rapid descent on a dime. Now, the sleek and elegant lines of 40 RDF, space all-environment attack craft hovered over a panicking city. Avik watched as one shape, larger and more bulbous than the others, descended to his doorsteps. For alien soldiers, clad in imposing power armor and armed with weapons he would have expected to see on a vehicle, stepped out and swept the streets with their guns. Avik did not panic. He knew why they were there. He stepped into the pages of history dressed in a fashionable three-piece suit, walking briskly into the shuttle as the soldiers barked orders. Thanks to advanced inertial dampeners, he felt nothing as it lifted off. When his shuttle left Earth's gravity well, the artificial gravity systems kicked in and Avik suddenly felt much heavier. Yera Prime was a large planet, and its size gave it gravity that was much stronger than the galactic standard. Military ships adhered to their homeworld standard, adding on a small amount to increase their crew's physical fitness. So Secretary General Avik was being crushed under the weight of 1.35 GS at this very moment. The flight to the Republic's claw took mere minutes. F-42s escorted President Wayne's shuttle until it left the atmosphere, with a squadron of Chengdu J-30s doing the same for President Junfeng Lin of the People's Republic of China. The three most powerful men on the planet Earth were about to meet with one of the most powerful women in the known galaxy. On board the formidable warship in low orbit, soldiers were being roused and duty alarms were blaring. While they were far from the deep, powerful horns of RDF combat alarms, the tones of the duty alarms still instilled a sense of readiness in every soldier who heard them. They had good reason to be ready for anything. The humans were coming on board. 